Good morning, good morning. Uh, for those who do not know me, my name is uh, Curtis. I am one of the lead pastors here at The Journey. So let's uh, bow our heads as we open God's word. Lord, this is your word. Um, this is your eternal word. And um, from it and through it, there's life, there's liberty, there's transformation. And God, I pray that in this moment, um, as we wrestle with what does it look like to experience your presence, I am praying that we would experience the joy, the abundance of joy that you have so ordained for your children to experience. And I am praying for those of us who are wrestling with that reality, Lord God. Make it real. Make it so tangibly real to us that we could not and cannot deny that reality. It's in your son's name we pray. Everyone say Amen. Amen. So today we begin our fall series, Facing God, where we um, are looking at various attributes of God, looking and wrestling through the, ga- the great character of God. And today uh, we, are, uh, we are looking at the presence of God, looking at what does it look like and mean to experience God's powerful presence, because uh, he, he does desire for it to be experience. Quite often when we refer to God, we refer to him as out there or in heaven, which is absolutely true. Um, but God is everywhere, as the scriptures affirm, but not just everywhere. But, but he wants you to know and to experience and to, and to live in the reality that he is right here, that he is near you, and that he wants you to experience that, that, that in his nearness, in his presence, that, that you are known fully, that you are loved deeply, and that you are transformed comprehensively in his presence. And so we're going to look at this glorious and beautiful presence of God. We're going to do so um, through, uh, through the life of a guy named Jacob. Um, this, this Jacob, as we look at him, he's going to serve as a backdrop and, and point us to what does it look like when we are wrestling through the presence of God? What does it look like for us experience this? So a little bit about Jacob. Um, Jacob is uh, the, the second born twin of Isaac, who is Abraham's son. You know Abraham, the, the great patriarch, the great man of, uh, of faith. And, and, and so Jacob comes along, the second born twin of Isaac, born into a, a family, a somewhat dysfunctional family, a dysfunctional for, in many ways, but, 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 but basically that when he comes, he is absolutely loved and adored by his mama, but not so much his dad. Like his dad liked the rough type, and his older brother Esau, the older twin, was, was the hairy hunter one. And his dad loved him and uh, uh, adored this Esau, leaving Jacob kind of uh, feeling rejected and outside. This Jacob coming in, now you have to understand the, the meaning of his name, Jacob. Jacob means trickster. Uh, it means deceiver, uh, it, uh, and, and it means manipulator, and this is what Jacob lives out. Like, he lives out the truth of his name from the very beginning all through his life, and in keeping up with this name. See, there was a great promise given to, to Jacob. See, Jacob was the younger, but, the, but, but, but in those times, the blessing and the birthright would fall on the older, but there was a, a promise and a blessing given to Jacob that Jacob would be the blessed one and that, and that the older would serve the younger, and the younger would be the one, the recipient of this great blessing. But Jacob, in keeping with his name, he refused to wait for God to, to bring fulfillment of this promise. And so he proceeds, and, and working with his mama, mind you, to betray his dad, to betray his, his, his ailing dad and steal this blessing from, uh, from his brother. Stealing, stealing the very blessing that God promised and wanted to give him. But is that not 
all of us in one way or another. When God promises, he, he says, I want to give you joy and an abundance of joy and life and meaningful relationship with me. But, but though God is proclaiming that over all of us, uh, is there anyone who can relate to me that regularly thinks in your mind, that sounds good and all, God, but I think I got a better way of finding that. I think I got a more faster way of finding God. You are seemingly slow in your fulfillment and, and too slow for my comfort. And so let me solve this my own way. And this is Jacob. This is, this is who he is. This is who we are going to be studying. The most unlikely character to even look at and ponder upon the presence of God. But this Jacob, betraying his, his father, now must leave home. He must leave the promised land. Uh, he must uh, leave the place that God promised that would be his because he betrayed his father, his brother, vowed to kill him. And so his mom says, you have to leave and you have to go to my brother Laban's land to find a wife. So Jacob, he is traveling along. And he, uh, and the scriptures say that this Jacob comes to a certain place, this, this particular, particular place. He's traveling along, and, and he is not thinking of anything, but, but yet the results of his sin behind him and the freedom uh, in Laban's land in front of him. But this moment, this time where he, he bows his head, he lays his head on a rock, and, and there's this moment. See, on the heels of such deceit on the heels of the evil trickery uh, towards his dad. It's this moment that God manifests his gracious presence to this Jacob. And this is what we see in Genesis 28, because when he lays his head on a rock, he has this dream. And, and in this dream, God reveals himself. Now, this, this is miraculous. This is gracious all by itself. See, uh, facing God's uh, uh, gracious presence, you have to see what's happening in this to, to really understand and rejoice in what's happening. See, for God to reveal himself to Jacob, like he's, see, you have to know God is never required to reveal himself to anyone. So if you're here and, and, and you know who God is and, and you confess Jesus, please know you are not here because you did good in school or you were a great person. Please know you're not here because your mama was a good person and you're just following after her footsteps. Please know you are here because God graciously opened your eyes and revealed himself to you. It's this gracious presence that Jacob finds himself in, revealing himself to a self-centered, ungodly Jacob, but not just reveals himself. He, he speaks to Jacob. And let's look at Genesis 28, where we are going to look at what he says to this Jacob. Let's start in verse 13, Genesis 28, verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed." All the family. See, see, he speaks these words. He's reaffirming the promise that he gave Jacob at birth and speaking words of blessing and promise. Now, now this, should, this should leave you uh, boggled. This should leave you confused because at this moment, this is when you say blessing like our thoughts of God, that if that on the, on, the, on the heels of such deceit, on the heels of such evil, on the heels of such ungodliness, these are not the words that we would expect God to use. Like, like put yourself in a scenario. If your, your child has utterly deceived you, has utterly lied to you, has utterly broken your heart, what are the first words you say to him or her? Go get my belt. Not, I'm not saying you're going to whip them. I'm just saying, I'm just saying it ain't going to be blessing. I'm just saying that for God to speak such words to such evil is crazy and mind-boggling, and this is grace. 
This is what the children of God experience in the presence of God for such promise. Because, see, you have to understand the beauty of God's promise. When God speaks, they're not merely words. When he speaks words, his promises have a way of reaching down into the most evil part of your soul and bringing things out of you that you didn't know were fully in you. He has the ability to create things in you that you weren't even thinking about being. This is who God is. This this is the profound nature of his promise. He told, he told Jacob, Jacob, you will be the one who owns this land. Jacob, you will be the one who has offspring to be a blessing. This Jacob, who, where the momentum of his life is moving in the opposite direction. He is childless, he is sinful, and he is dealing with the consequences of his sin. And this is when God speaks. <laughs> How beautiful it is. See, if you don't know, God has spoken over you. And maybe your reality doesn't fit the, the, the beautiful words that God has spoken on you, but he is not waiting for you to, to, to earn those words or to build your resume up for those words, but he will speak those words and call things out of you in his own power. Did he not? I mean, did, did, did Jacob have talks with his grandpappy Abraham when Abraham would tell him, do you know that I was almost dead and this God called me a father of nations, mind you? And in calling me a father of nations, he called things out of me? Oh, this is grace. And this is what you experience in the, be the beautiful presence of God. And he continues on in verse 15. Behold, I am with you. <laughs> Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you, and I will protect you. See, God, um, he doesn't just speak words of promise. He, he speaks words of pledging. He pledges himself to this Jacob. How profound it is for him to pledge himself to this Jacob, the, the ungodly and the unlikely See, see, God has this, this weird thing about him that he, he likes to link himself up. This perfect, holy God likes to link himself up with the most unlikely of people and say, I am with you. This is what we celebrate in the gospel. See, because it's throughout the scriptures, even with Jesus, no one could understand Jesus because the people Jesus would let in his presence were raggedy people. The people that Jesus would say, I am with you, were the unlikely people. But this is the pattern of grace. This is the pattern of God. He pledges himself to the scoundrel. He pledges himself to the prostitute. He pledges himself to the broken. Now, isn't it true, though, that many of us, maybe a faint thought, uh, some of us are imprisoned with the thought that if, if God really knew me, like, if God really knew that, that thing. See, because many of us are here because we're convinced we are here because God likes the good parts of us. That God has accepted the good parts of you, and he just, he, he, he don't know the bad parts. He don't know that, that, that messy closet in the back, the junk drawer that, of your life. He, don't, he doesn't know that. And quite often in the back of my, our minds, we wrestle with grace because we wrestle with, he's, he, yes, he's extended grace to me, but he's extended grace to the good parts of me, not to the bad parts. And if he knew me, oh, he surely wouldn't pledge himself to me. And, and the beauty of this is God is saying, I know you, and I'm still with you. I know what you did last summer. I know what you did last week. I know. I know your sin, your brokenness. I know that abortion you had. I know the adultery you had. I know the brokenness of your marriage. I know your anger issues. I know that addiction. I know the relapse that you have kept a secret. I know everything you've ever thought about. And God boldly proclaims, I am with you. How glorious is this God who pledges himself to people like us. This is grace. This is scandalous grace. And so Jacob, his response after this dream is surely, surely the Lord is in this place. Yet I didn't know it. Like how often... Is God surely in a place 
I mean, we don't know it. We're, we're consumed, consumed with our own lives and our own issues and our own pursuits and our own desires. And we completely miss the beautiful things that God is working around us and in us. But here's what's beautiful about God's presence. He doesn't wait for you to open the door for him to barge in. He will graciously break through and make himself known to you. So, so much so that you will walk away from that situation knowing surely the Lord is in this place. And I pray that that is some of yours, your testimony this morning, that maybe you just need to have such an experience where you proclaim surely, surely he is in this place place. So Jacob, uh, he wakes up, and then he heads on to, to his uncle Laban's uh, home looking for a wife. And there he will spend 20 years, uh, 20 years of being manipulated, 20 years of being deceived, and he would no doubt find uh, not just a wife but wives, and he would marry Laban's daughters, uh, Leah and Rachel, and, and he would, and, and through, through his, the trickery of his uncle Laban, yes, see, the trickster Jacob has met a far greater trickster, his uncle Laban, and Laban had put a working on Jacob. And then in Genesis 31, God says, it's now time to leave. It's time to come back to the promised land upon which I promised you. And so, so God leads Jacob out. Now, this is important because he leads Jacob out, and what we're going to see in Genesis 31 and 32, he's, he leads him to a place of pain. He leads him to a place of crisis. He leads him to a place where it doesn't make sense for God to have to lead him there. But, but see, it's love. It's loving that God will lead him, lead him there because it's often in those moments of pain and crisis and bewilderment that God's loving presence becomes that much more real to us. It's in those po moments where we begin to face our own frailty and humanity and brokenness that, that God shows up and, and shows us that he is here. And so Jacob, he is called out and he comes upon uh, this, this, this crisis moment. And he is distraught and he is afraid. Because remember, his brother vowed, when I see you, I will kill you. And Jacob is heading in a direction back towards his brother who vowed to do that. And Esau is heading towards Jacob with a 400-man army. <laughs> Jacob is rightfully afraid of what would happen. Jacob is rightfully afraid of the potential of this moment. He is in a crisis. But mind you, it's a mistaken crisis. See, Jacob, um, he... He was convinced that the biggest problem in his life was his brother Esau. And God will show him that that is not the biggest problem. Your, your crisis isn't that person. See, how often do we think the crisis, the pain, the wrestling, the struggling that we have, that's the biggest issue. And if only God fixed this thing, things would be made right. And, and, and God will show us, no, you have your eyes on the wrong crisis. The crisis is not the person or the person you lost that you, were, that you have rested your hope and your happiness in. The, the, the crisis is between you and me, God says, and how you are defining my relationship and how you are experiencing me. That is the crisis. And God will lovingly call you out for you to wrestle with that reality, for you to be set right in your mistaken crisis. I had one of these uh, crisis moments. It was three years ago. In fact, I was here at Tower Grove, and um, it was in uh, July, mid-July, and I was getting one of those urgent calls uh, from my mom and my wife, and when I finally uh, picked up the phone, they were saying, uh, rush to the hospital. Your dad is being, is being rushed to the hospital right now, and they don't know what's wrong. Have you ever had those moments, those, the, that phone call, that life-altering phone call? And that phone call that forever shifts your life. So I remember driving up 44 and then getting on 64, and you're swinging back and forth from, um, Lord, save him. Lord, save him. And then back to, Lord, prepare me for if you don't save him. But I don't like that, so Lord, save him. 
Lord, redeem, resurrect, do whatever. And as I pulled up to the hospital, getting out, and over time realizing and learning that they could not resuscitate my dad. He said, my precious dad, um, my dad who um, was one of the best grandfathers I had ever known. My dad who lay lifeless on the bed. And when I saw it, it was as as if when life left him, it left me. Like all hope and purpose was gone. Like I didn't want to do anything. I definitely didn't want to do ministry anymore. Because this man was gone and he meant everything to me. And I'm, I'm talking to God like, God, why? Why this man? Why now? Like, I'm just now. Like, you see, he's with, my, he's with my oldest son who was two at the time. Like, I'm just now learning how to be a dad. And you take my dad? Why now? Why him? Like, I got a long list of people you could have took, Jesus, if you asked me. I mean, if you wanted some thoughts, I could have shared some. Why this man? This man who was the biggest encouragement, this man when I preached would shout the biggest amen that would rock the room. This, this man who spoke words that brought me life, who would just in the middle of the day just call and say, I'm proud of you. Or, or even when I was a kid and, and playing basketball would, would be in the stands and at the top of his, his voice would scream, whoop, there it is. <laughs> yes, every bit as embarrassing as it sounds, every bit. That's not even a basketball cheer, Dad. Like, I'm not even sure what you're trying to say. What happened to defense? You're talking about whoop, there it is. <laughs> and I would do anything to hear that again. And God took him. And as I walk with God and process this, God just gently walked with me, teaching me, talking to me. And he walked with me, showing me. I said, Curtis. The crisis isn't so much um, your dad. That is bad and that's hard, but it's not so much your dad. It's not so much that your dad's not here. The crisis is you're not seeing that I'm here. You're not seeing that I'm your loving dad. You're not seeing that Jesus went to the cross and that I forsook my son. When my son cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You are not seeing that I did that so that you through Jesus could forever be my son. And there will never be a point where I quit talking to you and I quit speaking life over you and I quit uh, uh, calling things out of you that weren't there first. You are forgetting that I am your loving daddy. And I was like, gosh, you're so right. And in the end, I miss my dad. I wish he was here. But that's not the problem. See, the greatest problem was my greatest treasure. My greatest problem was not seeing God who he was. And my greatest treasure was experiencing the loving delight of the God who is proud to call him my dad. See, the crisis you're dealing with, I don't know what it is. I don't know how small, how big, but we all have them. Different colors, different sizes, different intensities. And you're wrestling and you're thinking that's the issue, that's the crisis. Like if only this thing, like if only this would work out, if that person would come or that thing would be fixed, if only that, then life would be better. And God said, that's, that's not the crisis. The crisis is you not seeing who I am in your crisis. And Jacob, he missed it. See, Jacob was afraid, and you would think it makes sense to be afraid, but didn't, did God not say in Genesis 28, behold, I am with you, I will keep you, I will protect you, I will bring you back. Did God not say that? If God said that and Jacob knew that, surely in the moment when even Esau would come, he would be reminded, well, God said it, so I believe it. I don't know what's going to happen, but he will get me back. But Jacob just forgot the beautiful words of promise. 
In this moment, Jacob cries out, praise to God, God, save me. Help me. And God answers. He shows up. He manifests his presence to, to Jacob. But not how Jacob expected him to. And surely not how we ever expect him to. See, because in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, when Jacob was all alone, afraid, he had sent everyone and everything away. Out of nowhere, someone grabs him, grabs him and shakes him and wrestles him, grabs, grabs him with such intensity that as if they, they were just trying to destroy Jacob. And Jacob is throughout the night in this, this intense, relentless life and death fight. Fight for his life. And he, fully, he doesn't even know who this guy is because out of nowhere, he just grabs him. But slowly but surely, Jacob realizes, I'm not just fighting a man. I'm wrestling God. And the scholars would affirm not just God, a pre-incarnate Jesus. Jesus was wrestling Jacob with such intensity, with such fierceness. And you would wonder why. Because Jacob was on the edge of the promised land. God was ready to bring him in. But God knew there was still too much of Jacob living in Jacob. There's still too much of him that he's trusting, that he's, he's still resting too much on his identity, on his ability. And God loves him too much to let him into the promised land like that. Because if he gets in the promised land, he will say, I did it. I got here. I'm here because I was able to manipulate and maneuver and do my thing. And God just happened to help me a little bit. And God says, no. I want you to experience my presence with joy and delight and my friendship. But you have to be changed to do that. And he wrestles him. And he touches him. Dislocates his hip. Man, ain't Jesus bad? One touch, pop, hip all out. <laughs> like, that's just crazy. And he took him. And now, Jacob... He's crippled. He's limping. But he's loved. He's facing and wrestling the God's loving presence. See, God will regularly bring us to these moments, these Jacob moments. These Jacob moments where we have to come to the end of ourselves. We have to realize, no more me, no more I. And God loves us enough to bring us there. He loves us enough to allow us to walk in pain. Because pain has a, a, a crazy ability to loosen our grip on things that, aren't, that don't really matter. Or not as important as who he is. Pain has the ability to transform us and shape us and make us aware of him far greater than anything else. See, so brings us to this Jacob moment. All of life with God are full of Jacob moments. Friendship with God, experience his presence, that all starts with a Jacob moment. And, and God will regularly bring you back to Jacob moments throughout the rest of your life. Because we have a tendency that, that keep grabbing after things instead of God. And so he'll give us these Jacob moments. Have, have you had one? Are you in one? Maybe you've never had one. Let me tell you about mine. At least my first one. I've had a lot of them. I'm a little stubborn. So it was 2001, and uh, life prior to that was um, overall pretty easy for me. Like things just kind of fell into my, my lap, and things came easy to me. I was just 
things that I did, I was at least somewhat decent with, whether it's sports or academics or my corporate career. And not only that, but I was like Jacob, man. I was a manipulator, deceiver. Like, even if I did get caught in a bind, I was going to be able to work my way out. And so that was my life for, for many years, self-reliant, prideful, all about me. And then over time, this, this deep frustration grew. Because over time, when I realized that all the, the deep meaning and purpose and joy that I was so longing for was not happening. And I kept trying and trying, and nothing would work. And so I'd give myself to, to my career more, or give myself to other things. I'd give myself to sex, or I'd give myself to alcohol. I'd go, give myself to darker and darker things, hoping that at some point I would just taste, even just a drop of, of satisfaction, just a, just a drop. I'd be okay with a drop. And nothing happened. And and every time I tried, it got worse. And over time, shame grabbed a hold of me. It was like a noose was around my neck. And shame was squeezing the life out of me. And I couldn't breathe. So much so, like, like if I'm honest with you, during that time, there were regular moments where I felt like I think the only way to experience peace is to kill myself. Like that's my only way to satisfaction. Because what I'm living is not that at all. I could barely look at myself in the mirror. I didn't know who I was anymore. So I give myself to my most trusted confidant at that time, which was alcohol. See, alcohol had the ability to give me the confidence to face another day because it would just numb the shame enough for me to function. And this grew increasingly worse, and, and I began this regular practice. Now, no matter what, I, I mean, I was drinking all the time, but especially when I was driving, I just felt like that, that was a, the best time to drink. I know weird, but that's what I was. And I remember I was home in the Metro East area, traveling back. I was living in the Chicago area at the time, and I was home for Memorial Day weekend in 2001, and I was traveling back. Uh, back to Naperville, and, uh, and I just kept up with my, my normal pattern. I would drink a 40 ounce before I hit the road. I'd get a styrofoam cup, fill it up with more, and I just hit the road riding. Didn't think twice about it. And as I traveled in midway between here and Naperville, I got in a car accident. In that moment, I was immediately arrested and charged with a DUI. And that was a moment that God just used that moment to begin to open my eyes. And it was as if he grabbed me. And I remember just sitting in the jail cell, wrestling, and then I remember going, uh, going home that night, and I couldn't sleep, wrestling me. And, and for days and hours, he wouldn't let me go. He kept grabbing me and wrestling me and showing me, this is who you'll be if you do not surrender. This is who you'll be if you do not give in. And I wasn't ready. There was still too much of me alive in me. And then days after, I was tired of wrestling. And I remember I was sitting at my desk in my apartment, and I remember going to my bedroom. I fell down on my knees. I just cried out to God. I said, God, this life, I've ruined it. I don't know who I am anymore. I barely want to keep living. I'm not sure if you're real, but I really need you to be. I need you to take this brokenness and do something with it. In that moment, as if I was enveloped in God's loving presence and warmth, 
just poured over me. I just wept. Well, I'm just like I'm doing now, man. I can't tell the story without crying. And every tear that came out, it was, it was as if he was washing the shame away. And I remember feeling like God who knew me, who saw every wicked part about me, yet still loved me. And in that moment when his love hit my wicked heart, I could breathe again. I could see the sun again. I could live again. Because God had wrestled me. And he wrestled me. And am I limping? Absolutely. <laughs> but I am loved. See, Jacob, God said, Jacob, I, will, I am renaming you Israel. Because you saw the face of God and you were spared, but not just spared, welcomed in the loving presence of God to forever enjoy friendship with God. And that is what he desires for all of us. For every last one of you, for you to say, in his presence, there is fullness of joy, and he will do everything and anything for you to experience that even give you a limp. And maybe you're here and you've never surrendered. Could I plead with you to see this Jesus? This Jesus who went before you to wrestle. He wrestled in the garden. So he didn't want to go to the cross but not my will, your will, God. This is what he says. And then he goes to the cross wrestling. And God turned from him. And unlike a limp that Jacob got, on, Jake, on Jesus, the full weight of God's judgment fell. He did not just simply get a limp. limp. He died and lost his life. And through that, he, he held on to God like Jacob, like, I will not let you go. And through that, prevailed over sin and death and given the name above all names so that every knee can bow to him. Have you bowed? The gracious, loving presence of God is found in his bowing and surrendering. And maybe you're here and you are. You are in the middle of the fight. You are in the middle of the night. Can I encourage you? God's in it with you. And those hands that you feel like are trying to destroy you, they're actually trying to love you. And I know it's hard. And I know you feel alone. And I know you think you can't keep going. But Jesus says, I won't let you go even if you try to let me go. I will have you, and I will love you. Would you rest in him? And those of us who are not in a Jacob moment, we've all experienced Jacob moments. May we rejoice with the testimony that Jesus never let us go. And the true confidence of our hearts, truly, with, with no embarrassment, uh, no questioning, confidently say, truly, in his presence, oh, there is fullness, fullness of joy. Let us pray. Lord, gosh, we need you. There's never a moment we don't. God, on behalf of every Christian in here, I thank you for you revealed yourself to us and you wrestled. And we have never gotten over that moment. And for those who are wrestling, and it's hard to trust and it's hard to believe and it feels like you're out for their destruction, may you show them that you're not. And may you bring them to the point where they are resting in your hands, knowing that limping in your hands is better than standing strong without you. God, do a work so that truly, in the depth of our heart,
we would say, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Amen.